So doing a quick recap of what we've seen so far is the Kia Hill was the most uh, strategic place for the military uh, in Macau, in the Macau Peninsula. It is the highest hill. Um, it has a commanding view over uh, on, the, on, the, on all sides, on all 360 degrees, either a vessel approaching Macau or any uh, troops that want to be positioned in the neighboring uh, territories and has a commanding view of all of over this um, over land and over sea. Um, uh, we seen that the uh, the for, for fortifications here in the Gia Hill um, that we're exploring this video mark the transition of the garrison into the modern age away from the 17th century fortresses for example one of these that is behind me which after the, this whole development of the new modern fortifications and the gun emplacements here in the Kia Hill, the, this old fortress was left only as a lookout. It still had a very advantageous um, strategic position to um, detect and to have a commanding view over the surrounding territories. Um, and let's move on. I just want to give a quick uh, touch on the uh, geopolitical reasons of why um, these earlier fortifications were, were built and uh, I will then move on into what is the different situation that the 1920s pose to, to the local garrison. In, in, the, 19, in the, 19, the early 20th century and then the 19 teens, this, the situation here is that the uh, Qing dynasty is losing more and more its grip, its control over the territories here in, in, in China and all over China um, actually is one of the reasons why we have regional um, powers uh, springing up because of the lack of central control. Um, and then we have the warlord period that is a byproduct of this uh, empowerment of local and regional actors. And one of the uh, one of the reasons that one of the consequences of what happened here, for example, in Macau, in Hong Kong, south of the uh, uh, Guangzhou, uh, Guangzhou for you, uh, in uh, Canton, um, south, so all over the Pearl River Delta, was the emergence of piracy in the lack and in, in an anarchical situation that the Qin dynasty was falling by the early 20th century, and then with the, in the 19 teens, this situation was even uh, uh, was aggravated even more by the fall of the Qing dynasty and a complete lack of control over the several provinces, uh, or a lack of central control over the central provinces. The situation that then um, obviously transpired here was a, a, a proliferation of piracy, and so the modern, the, these modern facilities that were built here in the 20th century in the Gia Hill were mostly focused on having a deterrence to, to this criminality, uh, piracy that it was, there was, um, it was growing exponentially here in this region. Um, in the 2020s, now we're facing it with a different situation. In, in the 1920s, now we have the warlord period in China achieving a very mature um, uh, stage. Um, actually, uh, the, the Portuguese were well aware of the situation that was happening all over China. In Canton, in the, here in this province, actually was the, one of the more stable uh, provinces. Um, Despite yes, there was a, uh, still a lot of piracy and, and, and criminality, as the as the, as the government in, in here in this province still did not have full control of the over the territory or could not address all of the issues that sprung up all over this vast vast territory uh, that, that is China. Um, and later on, the one of the catalysts for. Um, so in the 1920s, one of the catalysts that uh, uh, made the Portuguese want to reinforce and build more here in Macau is um, that, that fear of having undisciplined troops, for example, um, either forces from the Chinese army 
or from the Chinese Navy that would uh, mutiny and or would be or in some ways would be outside of the central control and would uh, demand by proxy of threat of using of violence so uh, for example this is the hypothetical if because the Portuguese have uh, full knowledge that they are not building the facilities here the military facilities here to counter any um, major Chinese force organized force that's not the whole point of the military facilities here in Macau it really is has the Portuguese point out in the early 1920s that is to have a form of deterrence of any undisciplined troops either on land or on sea because of the whole chaos that China was in so for example one of the cases that is one of the uh, one of the cases one of the situations one of the examples that they give is uh, a Chinese cruiser that is no longer being paid and actually it happened um, a, a Chinese gunboat whose um, uh, whose crew uh, mutinied and abandoned ship. In this case, they abandoned ship and they uh, the ship uh, anchored just outside Kolowan, south of Macau. And that w that's one of the situations where the Portuguese think, okay, in this case, they surrendered and they mutinied and they left the the gunboat. But what if the uh, what if there is a troop that is not getting paid, they're not getting their salaries, and so they're going to use threat by violence and threatening Macau with violence and in, in, a, in a sense in trying to extort money that way. And it's not in general um, a sense of um, fear of what is about to come. Another reason which is, causes the Portuguese some apprehension is the emergence of the labor movements um, all across China, but especially here in the Canton province. And um, this is 1920, for example, 1921 is when the Communist Party of China, Chinese Communist Party, uh, is, is emerges and is founded. And this clearly marks a trend of a empowerment of the labor forces, labor movements here in, in China. The, and Early on in 1922, there's a general riot um, here in Macau that is that is caused by those labor movements. Now, moving a little bit further into 19, for example, 1925, 1924, 1925, what happened is the um, uprising movement in Canton in the summer of 1925, which was repressed. Um, the, the Canton government requested the support of Chinese, uh, Chinese, some Chinese soldiers, but mainly uh, British forces, French forces, and th the Portuguese also participated in, uh, in the suppression of this labor movement in the summer of 1925 here in the south of China. Um, and so uh, not much uh, long after that, not much long after that, the, uh, there were a, a concentration of picket of strikers here just north of Macau. And what started as a labor movement then transformed into a protest, in this case an armed protest, against the unequal treaties that the Imperial, Chinese, uh, Imperial China had signed before in the 19th century, which triggered the, the narrative of the 100 years of humiliation, so which all started in equal treaties. So in 1925, that labor movement then transformed into an opposition against the uh, unequal treaties, and which, uh, given the part participation of the Portuguese forces in this situ particular situation in, in Canton, in the, in, the, in the Guangzhou city, it then triggered a, uh, a protest and opposition against the Portuguese presence in Macau. And in uh, 19, so we're talking about 1925. And for these years, 1925, 26, 27, there was uh, uh, every now and then there would be um, shots being fired across the uh, northern uh, border uh, where, well, 
the northern part of Macau in the Portos do Sic, one's up, uh, and the neighboring Chinese territory. So there will be machine gun fire from the Portuguese side, the armed picket strikers on the other side with strong affiliations more to those labor movements would then, you know, would fire and this would be going on for quite a while, for nearly two years. So just want to give a, a small snippet of what, what is the current, what is the situation at that time. Um, I'm going now to moving on to the 1920s and we're giving a, uh, a, uh, an insight of what were the major fortifications work, works done here in the Gia Hill um, during that period, 1925 and 1926. Stick around. The officer that was the brains behind these old uh, underground facilities that we can find in the Gia Hill that's that spread around the central part of the Gia Hill were the the uh, were ideas of a uh, Portuguese officer called José Guerreiro de Andrade, an artillery officer. Um, he had a combat experience in the First World War. He was part of the uh, CAPI, uh, the Independent Ar Heavy Artillery Corps that unlike the infantry, which uh, joined alongside the um, British troops, British army, the CAPI, the Independent Heavy Artillery Corps from Portugal, that expeditionary force fought alongside the French. And they were particularly manning a very heavy, arti very heavy uh, French artillery. Um, for example, railroad guns. It was some of the guns that the Portuguese were uh, manning in, in, the, in the battlefields in France. And José Guerreiro de Andrade, was one, he uh, had combat experience. When he came to Macau, one of the I first ideas that he put into practice, his ideas or what he wanted to see being built here in Macau, was the what we can now see today in the Mong Ha fortress. The Mong Ha fortress, the way it looks, it's completely different on how it used to look in the 19th century. Uh, and that and he in those works in the Mong Ha uh, fortress were from the 1925 and they were finished in 1925. So as soon as resources were freed from that um, from that endeavor, those resources, that manpower, then shift their focus into building the underground facilities that we can see today. Now, as we recall from from before, from what I've, from I've been uh, said, is that in the, the Gear Hill, in the early 20th century, in 1904 and 1912, 14, some facilities that were built here were already underground. However, it is not entirely uh, certain to what extent. This major endeavor is arguably one of the most complex fortification works of the 20th century in Macau. The underground facilities of these batteries allowed for a whole artillery company to remain underground if needed. It was equipped with il independent electric generators, barracks, transmission and command posts, magazines and ammunition lifts all underground. During these works, two names stood out, 2nd Sergeant Antonio da Cunha and soldier Daniel Fernandes Marques. Sergeant Antonio da Cunha was tasked with supervising on the ground the fortification works and installing the three 15cm crook guns and two Armstrong guns in the new emplacements. Soldier Daniel Fernandes Marques was commanded for playing an important role in works related to the underground galleries. Both men were commanded by the interim, interim governor, Hugo de Lacerda, in October 1926 for their dedication and extreme zeal. In November of 1926, Hugo de Lacerda visited the new fortifications in the Gear Hill and praised Captain Andrade for planning and conducting the works with notable dedication alongside with officers and soldiers of the CEAG, in this case the Compañía, the Europea de Artilleria de Guarnizão, so the uh, Garrison Artillery European Company. 
batteries in the Gear Hill were still called Baterias da Colina da Guia in 1926. So seemingly the name Guia Nova, that is New Guia, came after the new guns were installed in 1930. This is the, uh, the gun emplacement. It is um, very much original and has not been transformed later in the 1950s. So it's the gun emplacement that retains some of the uh, original features. We can maybe say it's also from features from 1904. Uh, but it's, of course, unclear whether or not the works from 1926 completely uh, implied the demolition of what was built uh, before and the and then total renewal of the site uh, upon 1926. Um, so I'll show you in a map where I am. So this is the uh, map, uh, a sketch of the underground facilities here in the, the Gear Hill in this case. The main uh, battery in the in the highest part of the in the mid ridge of the Gear Hill, and and the sprawling underground facilities that uh, that are located here, and we're just going to see a bit of the, these facilities. Oi, that is they're closed right now for safety, as we can see here on the left. Try and get so here on the left we have the underground facilities, the, the tunnels that go uh, underground. I so then we have on the right the elevator shaft for the ammunition to bring the ammunition up and down. We can see a cord up there of the elevator that would then lift the ammunition from the ammunition uh, magazine that is at the bottom, so a few meters. Uh, down uh, down the mountain um, who also helped uh, this was uh, excavated through granite and, uh, the gear hill is made of very hard granite rock and uh, the soldiers from the Europe from the uh, artillery company that participated in the in the construction and the and the, and the removal of the ex excavating the, inside the mountain but also the, uh, they were aided by the participation of uh, East Timorese uh, prisoners that were in, in Macau serving their sentences. Um, so uh, uh, East Timorese laborers also participated in the construction of these underground facilities. I am now moving, trying to move through this thick on the growth to see the main observation post for this battery that we cannot see fully but we can see it uh, with all facilities being underground and then we have the uh, observation post where they would see with a very uh, uh, range finders binoculars etc for hitting uh, targets we're going here on the side with the observation post to our right. Oh. It's tricky here, sorry. And then we have one of the emergency exits of one of the emergency exits that lead down to the tunnel. So that gave access to the underground part of the tunnels. So, let me just get it through. And this is a model of uh, many fortresses built around the world um, around this time, where building underground was seen as a way to counter the, uh, to better protect the garrison against much more powerful artillery. Again, let's remember the combat experience that this, the officer that came up um, with the brains behind this, he saw firsthand combat in the combat in the, in the First World War and saw the devastating effects of modern, modern artillery. 
And so his idea is, was to make sure that the garrison here in Macau was able to withstand what modern warfare is capable of, in the damage that modern warfare, modern artillery is capable of inflicting. And just go through the site, and I'm going back to, don't mind this little structure, I'll talk about this little structure a bit later, it's from the 1950s. This is a structure, not from a 1950s. So, that's why it's a very complex timeline is perhaps this is built in 1904 that was built in 1926 and this was built in 1954 so we can get an idea of the complex timeline that the gear hill um, uh, of the fortifications a complex timeline of the fortifications that exist here in the gear hill Here I am, uh, again, uh, sitting here in the uh, concrete of the uh, the 19, early 19, uh, early 20th century uh, gun emplacements. Um, what happened then in the uh, at the same time as these these facilities, these underground facilities were being built, is the requests to Portugal for acquiring more uh, weapons. And this was facilitated by the colonial office head at the time, which was Correia da Silva, who just year, years uh, previously had been uh, governor in Macau and actually facilitated a lot in the reinforcement of the garrison in the early 1920s. Uh, he, he, was a, he was an officer from the Navy and so it's clear that he managed to get pull some strings and ask the navy in portugal for some material to bring to macau um, one for example one in interesting side note is the original request was to bring anti-air artillery however because the, the portuguese navy did not have any specific weapons of, su of such that's why an alternative solution came to bring the seaplanes that were available in the in the storage uh, units in the, of the Portuguese Navy, and so why, that's why the seaplanes, the ferry seaplanes, came to Macau. But the original plan was anti-air artillery. Um, so the uh, uh, the Portuguese requested uh, artillery to, in a sense, modernize or at least um, artillery that could be in some ways better to the artillery that was already here in Macau. Um, because the idea was to build then a two systems in, 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 in the gear hill. So it was one with three, uh, three guns, one battery with three guns, uh, with all facilities underground. And then I have a separate system, a different battery, also with everything underground, except of course the gun emplacements and the observation post. So, the, so it was required to purchase uh, um, more uh, uh, guns from, and from Portugal and the idea was then to bring, okay, so we, it's going to be required to, buy, uh, to purchase more, so we should be uh, buying, uh, purchasing weapons that are more advanced. However, given what was available in the storage, in storage units of the Portuguese Navy was these two uh, aging. So we can see in this picture, these are, this is this. I, I, in this photo, I show uh, c where I am. So I'm right here um, in, these, in these three uh, uh, guns. And these, these are the guns that came to Macau in 1927 to replace um, the, the older Krupp and Armstrong guns. Um, then what came to Macau was these three French-made Schneider Canet, and this was because they came from the Saint Gabriel cruiser class, the Saint Gabriel and the Saint Raphael, so two cruisers that were built in France, in Le Havre, and they had on board a lot of uh, French uh, armament. And so what we have is 15 centimeter Schneider Canet guns. 
So these guns that we can see in, in the gear hill in this photo is this gun from the San Gabriel and this gun from the San Rafael cruisers. So what well, the guns that were positioned here in this gun emplacement in, 19, in the late 1920s onwards uh, until 1949, until 1949, 1950, the guns that were here were the French uh, Schneider Canet. And I'm then gonna move on to the other battery that is um, located over there and show you the other uh, two guns that were purchased in, in Macau. The, the, um, they were also Armstrongs, Vickers Armstrongs, and, and they are located further north on a battery that is located further north of this one. So I am just now walking towards one of the other, uh, the other battery that was built here in, uh, throughout the course of 1925, 1926, and was finished in the winter of 19. Uh, 26, 27, uh, which is the 12 centimeter uh, Armstrong uh, battery. Um, we can see one of the entrances here of this whole uh, complex. The, this complex has been, uh, in a way, uh, been modernized in a way to be able to welcome uh, visitors, but right now it's um, close to the public. They gave this name, maybe in the future if you come here you will know as the B, comp B uh, Complex B um, has been uh, named. So right now this, this entrance that we have here is over here and then originally on these two positions, so these are the underground tunnels that we can see, sorry, these are the underground tunnels that we can see. This is a magazine magazine over here and a magazine over there both serving the two uh, Armstrong guns that were positioned here. Over here is a observation post that has a 360 degrees and this observation post would be just for this battery while the other made bigger observation post was for um, all, 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 of, all of the two batteries um, for was the main one where the observation duties were more frequent. So you can say that they were permanently manned, unlike this smaller observation post, which I'm going to show. This is a, another entrance to the tunnels. Oh. And it's a beautiful, beautiful day. We have the refurb, re-modernized uh, gun emplacement f from the 1950s. Obviously, uh, the mountings of the Armstrong guns have not been touched, uh, and this is something that I want then want to explore a little bit with you. So, just give a little bit of an insight here on this observation post that exists just over here. So, this is the uh, observation posts in particular for this battery and then we have the gun emplacement which has been uh, modernized has this new structure from 1950s but the uh, the mountings for the 12 centimeter uh, Armstrong gun is still here and so the main Schneider can a 15 centimeter gun had uh, three three guns. It was a battery of three guns, while this was a smaller one with two two batteries. And the the other gun emplacement is located further this way. On a lower part of the the gear hill, slightly downhill from so somewhere up the hill in this in this uh, this way is the main uh, Schneider Kane uh, 15 centimeter battery so the main fortification system that we've that we can see the uh, underground uh, in, the, in this underground sketch um, slightly so I'll show point out where we are 
So this is the auxiliary, auxiliary um, battery that was meant to cooperate with the main battery up the hill. So it's facing today, of course we don't have a view, but over there is the outer harbor. So we can see the Zap Wong Tu is around this area, so with the outer harbor, the Macau Ferry Terminal, for example, the Macau Ferry Terminal is around this area. So it's facing the outer harbor and it has two positions, one on this side and another on the other side. Um, there's an observation post here in the media, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and so on this position actually is the also uh, where uh, naval guns were mounted in the, uh, in the 1920s, in the late 1920s. So the six-pounder, Hotchkiss six-pounders, uh, one of which is still here in Macau. Uh, so it has the entrances, it has one vent for the gunpowder. So inside, there, this is a magazine inside. This is the entrance to the, to the rest of the tunnels. And this is the entrance to the observation post and command. Oh, you could say where the where uh, they would direct fire from in this small battery. So maybe you can see in the mix this forest over here. I'll overlay a picture as well, just to give an idea. Observation post. And so moving on from this side of the observation post, we have the second uh, mountings for a Hotchkiss uh, six pounder. The Portuguese call it the, would put it in the metric system, the 5.7 uh, centimeter uh, Hotchkiss guns. And so again, the same thing, we have an entrance for the observation post and entrance to the tunnels and a we'll get closer okay. Oh, okay so the mountings so we have the observation post over there you can see Ooh, sorry On uh, this side, we have the entrance. So, the, for the other gun on the other side, and then here in the middle, we can see the entrance for the tunnels. And I overlay the picture so an idea of the long stairs. So, there's a, a very long stairs that go up deep in the mountain, about 10 meters underground, that go and connect with the the rest of the battery that is located uphill. The, the the main the main uh, fortification systems underground fortification systems that were built here in the Gia Hill. So you can just have a look inside of the the magazine that was placed um, right next to right next to it. it. Has been long long abandoned. So by the uh, uh, summer of 1930, all of these uh, new uh, weapons, new armament that came from Portugal was fully operational. Um, that was in, it, it was in July 1930, there was a collective um, uh, fire drill from all of these batteries and that's where we can say that officially they were um, fully operational as they were intended to, to be, where all of these uh, older guns, the Armstrong, the Krupp, Krupp guns were removed um, from their mountings and the, uh, these new guns uh, were put on their uh, place. Um, we come here and then, uh, uh, so this is 1930, we're talking about summer of 1930. Unfortunately, very soon after 
Um, the garrison actually didn't have that much ammunition at its disposal, but it was still enough. But a major um, uh, development came one year later in 1931, which was the explosion of the magazine in Florida. Uh, today it's just next to the where today is the uh, Flora Garden, the Long Hao Kung Yun. And it's just right next to it, and there was a massive explosion that caused a lot of devastating effects to the neighboring, uh, to the to, to all of, all of that residential areas around the, the magazine. Um, and so this was a, a, not a very good omen for the future of this of these batteries. Um, actually, just before in December of 1930, when this whole thing was already uh, this whole fortifications and the guns that were placed here were fully operational. Um, uh, Luis Pintelau still gave a, a scathing remark uh, concerning these, these, these guns here. It, it, he called them a museum of antiquities and he uh, reprimanded uh, those who decided that, it, that these, this was the best option. Let's not forget that the Schneider Kane guns were mounted on the on, on, on cruisers that were uh, built in 1898. So the guns were also of that age. Um, so by now, in 1930, these are guns that have more than are more than 30 years old. Which, in in terms of artillery technology, it's a it, there's a a great gap. There's a lot of development happened throughout the 1910s, uh, especially with the advent of the First World War, where there was a lot of uh, experiments and advancements made in technology and in warfare. Uh, so there's a great disparity in terms of technology-wise, the technology that came about in the 1890s and technology that was already available in the 1920s. Um, moving on in then into the 1940s and we now come and this is something that is very interesting because it involves the Japanese so the Japanese were here in, uh, in the south of China uh, first in 1937 and 1938 trying to blockade uh, trying to create a naval blockade for the Chinese and create a stranglehold uh, on on supplies from outside of China, uh, when the Jap when Imperial uh, Japanese Army and Navy uh, invaded invaded China, uh, so late 1930s. Uh, throughout, then we had the uh, the advancement of the Chinese uh, of the Japanese uh, throughout all of China, and included the full occupation of of the Guangdong province. Um, one of the results was the pressure. Of, they, for example, they took over, occupied uh, uh, Hong Kong, neighboring Hong Kong. Uh, Macau was spared from being officially occupied. However, the uh, forces that they exert exerted uh, next to the Portuguese administration were unsurmountable. Was uh, it was impossible for the Portuguese government here to uh, not be co coerced into acting in their favor or at least um, cooperating to to some extent with the Japanese and and for example one of the one of the pressures that one of the ways that they pressured the, the Portuguese government was by uh, the blockade of supplies of food supplies so in the summer of 1943 when there was a final agreement between both sides to at least allow some uh, food supplies to, uh, or at least to lift some of the restrictions being imposed in, uh, in food supplies. It's apparent that for the Portuguese, um, one ways, one of the ways that they had to play along the game of the Japanese and to lift some of those restrictions was. Um, un unfortunately, the giving a lot of military equipment 
to the Japanese in exchange for food, for food staples. And curiosity is that the two guns that were here in these mountains, the two Hotchkiss six-pounders that were here, were part of the guns that were handed over to the Japanese. So if, for example, it wasn't just the gunboat Macau that was given to the Japanese, it was other types of military equipment. And one of them, or in this case two of them, for example, these are the two Hotchkiss six-pounders. So the mountings remain, but the guns were given to, to, to the Japanese in exchange for food. So it's very interesting how this mounting is in some ways connected to the Japanese. Food for thought. So, having just mentioned the two Hotchkiss six-pounders that were given to the Japanese in exchange for food supplies, or for lifting those restrictions on the food supplies, one thing that was um, not given to the Japanese, and this is the whole, there's a bit of confusion if you go search for some information that exists on existing literature and publications, there's a bit of a mix-up. So, it's in some literature that exists, it is given the notion, that includes some Portuguese sources, that the guns, so these main artillery pieces that were on the Gia Hill were given to the Japanese. And that's not true. So, I've just explained that these two Hotchkiss six-pounders were indeed given to the Japanese. However, the three Schneider Kane uh, 15 centimeter pieces and the, uh, 12 centimeter Armstrong pieces, so the, 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 the main two batteries on the top of the hill, they remain as such. The guns that were there in 1939, 1940 were the same guns in 1945, 1946, so they remained in the same place. What was indeed given to the Japanese were not, th so those were not the guns that were given to the Japanese. What was given to the Japanese was indeed the guns that used to be here. So you remember the three Krupp guns and the two uh, Armstrong 10 centimeter quick firing uh, Armstrong guns from the 18, uh, from the 19th century? You remember those? Those guns were in storage here in Macau, they remained in storage. They were simply rem uh, removed from their mountings and disassembled and put into storage. Those were the guns that were given to the Japanese. Um, it is unsure why the Japanese did not request for those guns that were on the, on the, on the top of the hill. Maybe it was a red line that the Portuguese uh, made that they were not willing to give those uh, guns that were uh, mounted at that time. Uh, and so I w it, 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 it's a point of clarification I wanted to make because if you go and search online, it's going to be some sources that are going to indicate that the guns that from the Gia Hill were given to the Japanese. Yes, but it's more complicated than that. The ones that were here in the, during the Second World War, during the Japanese Second, Second Sino-Japanese War, those guns were the same throughout the whole time. What was indeed given to the Japanese were the older uh, guns that were in storage. And so it's a point I wanted to just uh, very quickly clarify. South of the main fortifications and under the, Gia, the 17th century Gia Fortress, there is a tunnel that bears on the entrance the date of 1931. Um, this fact has led many researchers astray, as into they, it's not correct that the whole Gear Hill tunnels were built in 1931. Uh, a claim that has been made by several researchers that may have given some uh, indication of the fortifica fortification works built uh, done in the Gear Hill over the 20th century. In fact, this tunnel, uh, where the uh, in the in under the, the the lighthouse, 
and a 17th century fortress is installed is an underground gallery where a 30 kilowatt origin generator group is installed uh, destined to supply electric energy to the whole of the gear uh, to only work as backup. Uh, in 1921, 10 years earlier than uh, when this uh, tunnel was built, well, there are already mentions of the necessity to have an independent uh, electric supply to the gear hill. So, in essence, the generator that you can see here in the, uh, in the video is to work as a backup only for in in this was the uh, case scenario in which led to its being to being built is in case the Macau the Melco Macau Electric Company uh, lost power in, in essence Macau was without electricity and so by building this generator independent generator the whole gear hill and the batteries installed would be able to uh, work function normally independently from the rest of the electric grid of the city unfortunately currently only this small stretch of tunnels in the gear hill is accessible by the public all the others or uh, all the other batteries the 15 centimeter battery and the 12 centimeter battery are currently uh, close to the public, uh, access is not allowed. Hi everyone, so this is the end of the part two of the Gear Hill military history. Um, I had a lot of fun again making it and recording it. I hope you had also uh, had fun watching it and learning a little bit more about this place and also about M Macau's military history. Hope I can see you in, hope you can enjoy watching my next videos and other videos I have in my channel. Um, thank you so much for watching. See you next time.